<clears throat> All right. I think you can hear me now. I, I was sitting here talking <laughs> and I didn't realize I had to go live. <laughs> so now I'm live. So here I am. Uh, gosh, welcome for those of you already here. And for anybody who pops on, I'm Heidi Viegas and my website is healingharvesthomestead.com. And my YouTube channel is just the same thing, pretty much. And we talk about herbalism. We talk about aromatherapy. We talk about natural living, natural health and wellness. And um, I feel so blessed to be here uh, with you guys. And I, I really thank you for, for popping in. And so I've got questions in the YouTube community. So I'm going to go ahead and answer those. I'll try to answer questions in the chat and I can be here today for about 45 minutes and then I have to hop off. So yes, let's um, go ahead and get started here. I'm going to do that pop over to the community uh, questions real fast because uh, people put those in there. And you know, before I start, and I just want to say, hi, Melissa, so glad you're here. And hi, Ellen from Georgia. And hi, Conscious Gardener. Love the name. <laughs> it's awesome. And uh, and anybody else who hops in here, welcome, welcome, welcome. And please say hello in the in the chat. And, and you can write your questions in there and everything else. But um, yes, let's go ahead and start talking about the herbs. But before I do, oh, hello, Michelle from Nebraska, <laughs> you lovely lady. Um, <clears throat> I just want to mention, I'm not a medical doctor. I am an herbalist. Um, I, I'm no, I am no kind of medical professional. And so I am an I'm herbalist, I'm an aromatherapist, and I work um, clinically with clients, not patients, because I'm not a doctor, and uh, work on helping people balance their bodies. And I love teaching. Teaching is like my, my favorite thing. So that's a little bit about me. And so the questions that I answer today, any answers are not to be misconstrued as medical advice. They are simply um, my opinions and for educational uh, purposes only. And that's just because I have to say that. <laughs> Don't want to get in trouble with the powers that be, the censoring powers or the FDA or anything else. So hi, Jackie from Pennsylvania. Hi, Deborah from Arizona. Hey, Lily from Missouri. What a cool name. I like that name. My grandma name is Mimi. I'm a grandma. <laughs> so hi, be youthful bath and body. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going to I'll uh, go ahead and start by answering the first question and then uh, pop back over to the um, the chat over here, too. Awesome. Casadilla, thank you. Just signed up for the certification course. And I don't know if I said, is it Casadilla or Casadilla? But thank you. And you're going to love it. Uh, oh, my goodness. You are going to learn so much. So that's fabulous. Uh, for those of you wondering, that uh, this is open enrollment week for my Ditch the Drugstore course. And we do have a family certification option if you want to do that. And, um, and by the way, before I dive into the questions, let me just put a couple of links in here for you. Um, I'm going to be doing my free webinar training. It's a workshop on the five best herbs for your home apothecary two more times this week. The first one was this morning. And um, wow, what an active group. Lots of great questions in that, in that workshop this morning. And the people learned about five amazing herbs that you can grow. So that's the link right there. Um, I should remind people what it is. <laughs> Okay. And it's free. Just you need to sign up and register. There is a replay if you can't make it live. So I wanted to just uh, share that with you. And the other thing I'm going to share with you real fast is a link to get information about Ditch the Drugstore. And that's the course that's open for enrollment right now. Um, and that's Ditch the Drugstore right there. <clears throat> Uh, Debbie says, I finally made it. Hot Springs, Arizona. Beautiful. Oh, I bet you're gardening like crazy right now. That's awesome. Oh, thank you, Lil Lilia. I appreciate that. Your hair looks so beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Do you know what? I got COVID um, October of 2022. 
and it was horrible. And ever since then, like my hair changed. Before that, I, I had, I used a lot of henna, and it just like, it, it started falling out. Uh, and then I took a lot of herbs, <laughs> and um, had a couple of other strategies, and uh, basically at that point, just decided to go have the local lady put some different colors in it because it was so frizzy and I couldn't get it to do anything. So anyway, I appreciate that. My hair is, has never been my favorite thing. <laughs> so, oh, Felicia from Texas. Hi there. All right, you guys. Well, let me head over here uh, to the questions again. And Nancy says, I would like to know what herbs to use for a sacroiliac pain sap. Thank you, Heidi. I hope you had a wonderful Easter with your family. Yes, I did. So the sacroiliac joint is that um, it's a C-shaped joint. This is for people who aren't familiar with this. And it connects the um, sacrum to um, basically the, the part of the hip. And it just provides movement in there and it provides cushioning and it's quite important for a lot of movements of our legs. And um, so I would suggest if you're needing a pain sap for that area, I would probably go ahead and ask why. Okay, so holistic herbalism, we always ask a little bit more about what's going on. It's not as simple as what, you know, drug can you take for this or that? Because we don't mask. We want to figure out what's going on and get to the root cause. So the first thing I would wonder is what's causing the pain. Is it inflammation? Is it something going on with the joint? I mean, what is it? Is it arthritis? So, um, so knowing that would be really helpful in terms of knowing what herbs to do. Uh, to start working with. But in general, so I'll speak in total generalities here, we're going to talk about turmeric, cur um, which has curcumin in it, which is amazing for inflammation and can do wonderful things in the joints if that's part of the problem. And then black pepper, because the piperine in the black pepper helps the curcumin and the turmeric be a lot more bioavailable to us because the curcumin really isn't all that um, interested in getting into our bodies. <laughs> so it needs a little bit of help in terms of the black pepper. So those are two that I would start with internally. Okay. I would definitely add those as an internal, um, option. And then as a salve, then I would probably go with comfrey would be good. Cayenne, ginger, those herbs are very anti-inflammatory. And then I would power it up with some essential oils. And um, we actually talk a lot about stuff like this in Ditch the Drugstore because pain is some, something that a lot of us live with. It's, it's, um, it's very, very important to just have some broad understandings of, of the pain response and different things we can do with it. So that was a general answer, not having more information. Uh, Tracy says, question, I discovered pennycress growing in my yard. Is there any medicinal qualities I can harvest this for? I don't think pennycress, and I would need the Latin name for sure, but I believe that's an edible. So I'm, you can pick it and eat it and you could put it in salads, but no, I don't think it's, um, it's super medicinal, unfortunately. And then this is from um, a YouTube user. I am an active 64 year old. I'm in good health. I run three times a week and also work out. Bless you. You are so lucky and fortunate. Um, I, I miss working out and I really need to. I, I need to, I, you know, I'm really great at telling other people what to do. <laughs> But I, I could definitely uh, use some more activity in my life. I'm just so busy with, with this, with the school. Um, anyway, what herbs or herb would you recommend as your top pick for someone like me to stay healthy with age? You know, um, I love the nutritive herbs, and there are quite a few of them. So I would choose those mineral-rich herbs like nettle leaf, dandelion leaf. These are like vitamins, you know. Um, I just did that. A YouTube video on uh, how to make a multivitamin and uh, and that's like a candy, a little ball. And, you know, those are really fun to play with. But herbs like that that have minerals in them are super helpful. Um, and then, you know, if you 
I would boost it up with other things you think you might need. Cocoa nibs um, are wonderful. They're uh, good for you. Let's see. That's probably what I would what I would do is just stick with your nutritives, your general good nutritious um, herbs. And many of them are also really good for your kidneys too. So let's see. Don says, I'm interested in information on using burdock. Okay, so I'm going to tell you to please go watch my video on burdock tincture. Um, I just, I think I did it about nine months ago or so. It's pretty interesting, I think. Well, burdock is interesting. Uh, and in that video, I show you what a good tincture looks like and um, some uh, constituent called inulin, which is really helpful for your uh, gut. It's a, pro, uh, it's a prebiotic, meaning it feeds the um, good bacteria and that helps alleviate the bad bacteria naturally. So it's burdock is amazing. Burdock also is exceptional for the liver. It's one of those really great herbs that goes to work and helps the liver do its job a lot better. So uh, it's my favorite one. In fact, when there's whenever there's mysterious um, eruptions on the skin or skin issues, burdock is often what I'll say, well, let's just give this a try because that helps the liver to just power things up and, um, and improves the filtration process of toxins out of your body. Um, so there's a little bit of information on using burdock. I could literally talk about burdock for a couple of hours and it's, it's just a, such an amazing plant, but um, check out that video because there's a lot in that video. All right. Deb says, any suggestions for herbs that might benefit hypothyroidism? My daughter has had it for years, went through radiation and chemo treatment for breast cancer, which further damaged her thyroid. Medication is not balancing it out. So currently she's not on anything. Interestingly, her hair actually quit falling out after she quit the meds. I'm, um, boy, not surprised. <laughs> you know, all of these autoimmune issues and hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, you know, I, I think a lot of what's going on with people's health is due to environmental toxins, toxins in our food, you know, and we, definitely need to um, figure out a way to clean ourselves up as naturally as we can. There are some herbs that can help with the thyroid um, though, and especially since she's not taking the meds anymore and her hair quit falling out, I would say good decision on good decision on that one. Um, but adaptogen herbs would be the category of herbs I would probably go with to suggest for hypothyroidism because the adaptogens get into your body. And number one, they help with the stress response in terms of um, balancing the cortisol levels. They just seem to help the body deal with physical stress, mental stress, emotional stress, you know, all of the stresses basically, and um, help keep us healthy. Ashwagandha is one, probably the top one I would choose for that. Uh, Bacopa manieri is really helpful potentially for some people. And again, all of our bodies are different. So what works for other people may not work for you and vice versa. But these are generalities I'm, I'm sharing with you. Another thing about Bacopa that I just really love is that it's helpful for the brain. So I, I really just love you know, that herb in conjunction with especially rosemary, sage, um, go to cola. Some of those are excellent for brain health too, but let's get back to the hypothyroidism. Uh, the lion's mane and the reishi mushrooms might be helpful for uh, hypothyroidism. Astragalus is another adaptogen as well as holy basil to look into, but these are really good. Um, but honestly, Lifestyle is an incredibly helpful, especially with indications like low thyroid. Um, so going gluten-free, uh, limiting your um, uh, consumption of cruciferous vegetables, like stay away from the, uh, the goitrogens, the cabbages, the you know, Brussels sprouts and things like that. I was just listening to Dr. Ken Berry talk about... Um, plants in terms of how dangerous they are for our health, which is something we don't hear very much. But he definitely was not happy with the goitrogens in terms of our health. Um, 
And then be sure to exercise and reduce your stress levels, which I personally just uh, love using essential oils as, a, as helpers for that. So um, that's th those are some general ideas or for things that you can um, think about for hypothyroidism. <clears throat> Let's see, Renee says, I would like to know a good alternative for antidepressants. I know St. John's word is used, but I don't have access to fresh. I know with the fresh wilted, it turns red, but with dried, it turns green. What are the differences between the two? So St. John's word is definitely one of those herbs that is best used fresh. And this isn't the case in a lot of herbs. Um, some herbs are actually better used dried, but not St. John's. It's really helpful um, for the nervous system in its totality. So um, if it has anything to do with the brain, uh, the nervous system, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, you know, any of it, St. John's wort is really helpful um, in terms of the body. So I would say that would be a good start. But if you're on medications, here's the caveat. Always, always, always look into herb drug interactions because um, St. John's wort has one of them is what an herb that has one of the, some of the most drug herb drug interactions there are. So be careful with that one and do a little double check. Um, but yes, you would, you, I like to work with the fresh herb and then I tincture it. I make the infused oil with it. And then you can uh, take the tincture internally if you like. Um, and you can all obviously use it topically. It's super helpful. Uh, but for antidepressants, uh, Herbs don't work like the drugs do. Herbs or the drugs actually, you know, they play around with your brain chemistry. And that's something that it makes me really nervous, to be honest. I, I'm not a fan of that. And I'm a person who was um, diagnosed with clinical depression in my 20s. And the doctor put me on Prozac back then. And I didn't like it because it was... Um, uh, it didn't, it didn't help really all it, it did even me out. Uh, but I noticed that I wasn't laughing and I wasn't crying and I wasn't anything. And so I got a little worried about that and said, okay, I think I'm going to try to manage all this naturally. And I did. And this was before I knew about herbs. I found that for myself, exercise uh, good, hard exercise was one of the best things that I could do. You know, the kind of exercise that makes you sweat and, um, and that really gets the endorphins going. Endorphins are no joke and they should be taken seriously as good helpers for, um, you know, depression and things like that. So, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice. These are some suggestions that you can, can look into and, and take a look at. Um, and then besides St. John's wort, which is amazing, lemon balm is another one that might be um, helpful for you or for some people. It's very calming, but it's not calming to the extent that it's going to put you to sleep. So it does help with anxiety and things like that. Um, so there you go. Two really great herbs that support the nervous system, the whole thing, <laughs> which is great. And um, finally, I want to mention essential oils. So essential oils have been clinically studied and clinically proven to affect the um, just the emotions and emotional health and the way that people react in many um, different situations from extreme stress to uh, generalized anxiety, things like that. So your citrus oils um, contain limonene, which is really helpful for uplifting the mood and other essential oils can calm if you need calm. And then there's others, the spice oils generally make people feel uh, safe, grounded, um, and then there are the grounding oils like your frankincense and your vetiver that just, they they do the same thing, I think, as the spices. Very similarly, they make, they make you feel safe and grounded and just like you're getting a big hug. <laughs> the florals, too, make you feel happy. So, But I do love working with the essential oils. Um, for many people, uh, they can also help with brain health as well. So when we're talking about um, depression and, and things like that that have to do with brain chemistry, then 
some of those would be potentially helpful to start working with a little bit. There, uh, and they're not, they don't have any contraindications to speak of. There are some contraindications, let me just say that, but um, only if you're on certain drugs and, you know, really that's a contraindication with essential oils, especially with inhalation, it's pretty rare. So as if you're, I'm talking about adults, okay, uh, this is not for children, but that's what I would probably do. In terms of the um, the St. John's wort turning red, you know, when you put it in oil versus green, if it's dried. So the red indicates that you've got a nice amount of the hypericin, which is the active chemical in St. John's wort that you want to have. And uh, it's really helpful. The infused or oil of St. John's wort from the dried plant is pretty, it's not super useful, to be honest. It, you know, it's a little bit useful, but not super useful. And uh, so therefore, I don't suggest it. However, you can still tincture the dried St. John's wort oil. But if you can, work with the fresh. Okay. NG says, thank you for providing us with great information and knowledge. You're so welcome. <laughs> how can we tincture milk thistle and how much to take daily? Okay, uh, I love milk thistle. It's really amazing for the liver and supporting the detoxification process in your body, keeping your liver healthy. Even if you are dealing with something like fatty liver disease or um, you know, liver issues in general, milk thistle is so helpful. And um, here's a couple things to know about milk thistle. So milk thistle is not soluble in water. And I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is since, since we're talking about um, <laughs> uh, milk thistle, let me see if I can find my photos. I was in the store the other day and I saw, um, I'm gonna cover the brand up just so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> I saw this box of herbal tea, milk thistle tea, and it just made me roll my eyes. <laughs> and it made me roll my eyes because the active chemical in milk thistle, which is the silymarin, is not soluble in water at all. <laughs> Just want to point that out. So that's either, that's an example of one of two things and neither are good. Either it's an example of a company who's taking advantage of the fact that the average lay person has probably heard that milk thistle is good for the liver and they're sticking it in a tea just to get you to buy it, which is bad. It's unethical. Uh, or it's an example of the company is very ignorant <laughs> and does not know about herbs, <laughs> which is also unethical. You shouldn't be selling something that you know nothing about. So anyhow, I wanted to share that uh, with you. And so tincturing your milk thistle is a good idea. What I would do is use the powdered milk thistle. And I oftentimes don't recommend using powdered uh, powders in your uh, infusions because they tend to get gummy and stick together. Um, However, in the case of milk thistle, which is really hard, it's very, very hard and crunchy, I like to use it powdered because that just makes sure that you're getting the most of that good silymarin in your infusion as you can. Um, you can also take the little seeds, it's the milk thistle seed that is the part that's medicinal, and you can crush them. Again, or you could use the powder, you can put it in smoothies. Ingesting it, honestly, is like the best way to get your milk thistle um, in you. But in terms of tincturing, it's just pretty standard. Um, fill your jar up. This is the folk method. Fill your jar up about a quarter to a third of the way full. Top it off to within an inch of the top with your alcohol. And um, in the case of milk thistle, um, anything between like 80 and 100, 120 proof is going to be a good uh, alcohol amount, um, alcohol versus water. And I'm going to actually reverse that. <laughs> and uh, talk about milk thistle. I'm sorry, because that's what I usually generally say about most herbs, but with milk thistle, I would go with the high proof for sure. Okay. Patricia says, what are the five essential oil must-haves in your home? Um, okay, she's got a few questions here. So five essential oil must-haves. I did a video on this, the best essential oils to be sure you have around. And um, so let's just talk about uh, the the basic ones, uh, lemon, 
super broad range of use. And, and lemon boosts your immune system. So that's always good. It cleanses the air too. So lemon, I love peppermint um, as well. It's a good digestive. It is energizing. It, you know, gets you going in the morning. I think peppermint is even better than a cup of coffee. It's wonderful. Um, let's see here. Rosemary. Um, I love time. You know what? How can I do this? I love them all. <laughs> There are just so many, um, but but for the basics that you might just enjoy diffusing all the time, uh, lavender would be in that category. I love frankincense. Um, you know, there's there's quite a few, but generally, um, oh gosh, let me just say sweet marjoram. I nobody talks enough about sweet marjoram, and it's a very sustainable herb. But I couldn't live without it. It's it's really incredible. As it's very calming and peaceful. Clary sage is another one, patchouli. So there you go. I'm way over five, Patricia. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I do love them so much. And then Patricia says, how do you know what dosage is a good starting dosage? And this is a great question because we're all different sizes, right? And also the herbs are going to be dosed a little differently depending on on uh, what they are. But generally speaking, if you're an average sized adult, um, you know, 150-ish or so pounds, you're going to be starting with about a half a teaspoon or so of a tincture, all right, or a cup of tea. And then you're going to adjust from there. And it's a really good idea to start on the small side and then go take more or or edge it up. And um, yeah, that's what I would I would suggest there. Um, and then number three, I've gotten my hawthorn berry leaves and blooms tincture and about started taking for blood pressure. What would you recommend to start daily and when to increase? The dropper doesn't always suction full, so millimeter dosage. So Patricia, I would suggest going with that half teaspoon amount, okay? And in it, I don't have my tincture. Let, let me go grab my tincture bottles really fast here and show you something. Sorry, I don't, I don't know if you could hear the floor squeaking, but um, so let's take a look at a tincture bottle. So here we have some elderberry tincture, and I just want to show you this. Okay, so here you've got your, your little glass um, dropper, and this is full, all right? So no matter how hard I squeeze, that's full, <laughs> all right? That is a full dropper, and if you take three of those, that's about a half a teaspoon. Okay. And in terms of when to increase, you would increase um, according to the herb you're taking and according to the need. And, you know, that's going to just depend. If you were talking about hawthorn, hawthorn is a food herb. So it's very, very safe. It, strength, it strengthens the heart muscle. It's really, he it's really heavenly too. It tastes pretty good. You could probably take that as often as you like. <laughs> it's a, it makes a great cordial too. But honestly, I would say start off with uh, um, a half a teaspoon a couple of times a day. See how you see how that does and then make adjustments. Uh, Jackie asks about thoughts on freezing fresh milky oat tops to be able to defrost and use at a later date. I think it's a great idea. Uh, milky oat tops don't retain the milky substance for very long. And, you know, if you buy them dried, the milky substance is gone, basically. So that's another herb that's really nice if you can get them fresh. But you can uh, definitely freeze them and then reuse them later. I've never done that, by the way, but it's a great idea, and I would not hesitate to. We freeze our elderberries every year. We go harvest what we need. We, we get enough to get us through winter, and we freeze them, <laughs> and then we have them to use. Uh, let's see. Katie says, I'd like to know how to use a diffuser with essential oils. I realize that's not a specific question, but if there's a way for you to put simply the basics of how to, I'd really like to know. Yes, and it, that's um, – I've got my diffuser going right here. I will – let me see if I can grab it here. It's actually running right now. 
There you go. <laughs> I've got peppermint and bergamot in here. So this is an ultrasonic diffuser. And this is one where you fill it up. The max on here, you have to look at the max level. Oh, there you go. It's right there. So that's the max level of water. You put your water in there, and then you put a few drops of your essential oil in there. And you should follow the manufacturer's instructions because they're going to be different depending on um, the company. I tend to like my diffusers a little on the heavy side. Um, and that's just me personally. And I've been diffusing like that for years. But start off with what the manufacturer says, and then you can adjust for yourself. Now, if you're diffusing around little babies, small animals, you know, little, little tiny ones, I would suggest not diffusing anywhere near them and making sure they can get out of the room. Babies, you should never diffuse near their faces because um, you know it's their little systems are very small. They have to filter all of these chemicals out. So just a little, that's just basically how you use a diffuser. If you get a nebulizing diffuser, a nebulizer actually puts the, um, the pure mist of the essential oil into the air. And that's all it is. There's no water. There's no, uh, like this has got a moist feel to it because it's water mixed with the essential oils. Mm. <laughs> By the way, I'm diffusing peppermint and bergamot in there. Really beautiful combination. But um, with a nebulizer, you just put the essential oil in, turn it on, and that's extremely powerful. You can cleanse a room um, like that. And I have a nebulizer, and um, if I want to clean a space, I just make sure there's no people, animals, or whatever in there for a while, and I run it for a few hours, and then I come turn it off, and, and it's really, uh, really helpful, really great. All right, I am going to go ahead and... Um, tackle some of the questions in the chat here. But first, I want to, I'm going to invite you all again to the five best herbs for your home apothecary workshop. I'm doing two more of those this week. It's a really excellent workshop. And it comes with a 29 page book that's free. And it's, um, you can register right there. And uh, the book comes with recipes and remedies, and it's really uh, going to give you some ideas about getting your home apothecary started. I'd love to have you come. All right. Let me scroll back up to the top here. Um, yes. So can I please talk about sweet wormwood? So that would be like sweet annie, which is Artemisia annua. And um, it's got some benefits. I'm usually... Um, you know, we always hear, be careful about wormwood. Wormwood can be dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And it can. Most of the wormwood uh, species, the most of the artemisias are great dewormers. That's why they're called wor wormwood. And uh, I'm not sure about sweet Annie. I've never actually used it. But um, I know that it's been used in some places for... Um, issues with the rectum like hemorrhoids or uh, constipation even. It can be helpful with diarrhea. I've heard it can be uh, helpful for a number of different things. Um, it seems like I read some time uh, ago that it might have been useful for malaria um, in certain countries. It is a uh, plant that's used in traditional Chinese medicine. And uh, so it does have some benefits, but I would do a little bit more research on that one. And I believe it's a, a relative of mugwort. And mugwort's a really nice herb to work with if you uh, want to get some crazy dreams <laughs> going on. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty cool herb. All right, let's see here. Melissa says, is there any other herb that would work for your brain candy recipe other than Illithero? Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> there, there are um, some other herbs. So if you really wanted to, um, if you wanted to substitute with an adaptogen, because Illithero is an adaptogen, I would probably uh, see if you could get a hold of some rhodiola, which is quite expensive, but it's, you know, similar in terms of of the fact that it's like an energizing um, adaptogen herb. Um, ashwagandha would be helpful too. Other herbs you could put in that brain candy. Uh, sage is amazing for the brain. Rosemary uh, is amazing for the memory. Um, 
Uh, Bacopa Manieri is helpful for the brain. Godicola is helpful for the brain too. So there are quite a number of herbs you could substitute. And I'll just say here, I do have a YouTube video on nootropic herbs. It's spelled N-O-O-T-R-O-P-I-C. And if you search for that on my channel, um, I dove into some uh, different herbs that are really helpful for the, for the brain, okay? Chris says, I'm looking for any tips for eczema. Um, so Chris, this is a situation where I'd probably want to talk about possible root causes. If I were working with you as a client, that's the way the direction uh, of the conversation would go. Um, but in general, uh, you know, otherwise you're just dealing with symptom management like, you, you know, most drugs are. <laughs> so, but if, if that's what you need, if it's like really itchy and hard, I do have a pretty good anti-itch bomb uh, recipe and it's on my website. So you can look that up, but it's helpful. And then oatmeal, oatmeal baths, things like that can be, can be helpful uh, with eczema. Let's see here. I'm looking, I'm in the chat, you guys looking for more questions. Um, Ashley says, my brother wants me to make him a willow bark tincture, but he can't have alcohol. What is a good alternative? So there's a number of alternatives uh, to alcohol. You could use vinegar as a solvent and uh, vinegar and willow would work pretty well together. Um, another one that people really like, and it's a sugar alcohol, but it's not like an ethanol alcohol. So it's not the same thing at all, is glycerin. And I'll just say that with the glycerin, you need to be sure you're getting food grade, uh, preferably organic, because uh, glycerin can actually uh, come from petrochemical waste. <laughs> okay, so just be aware of what you're buying. Um, and if you're going to ingest it, make sure that it is food grade, because most glycerins will tell you for um, skincare use only or not for internal use because glycerin is really good for the skin. But regardless, I like to get the food grade. And the way you're going to, I don't know if I have a video on glycerites on my YouTube channel or not. Um, I do have it in my medicine making class. It's definitely in Ditch the Drug Store because <laughs> we have a lot of recipes for children and, and things in there. And a lot of parents don't want to give their kids alcoholic tinctures. I just want to say that um, I don't have a problem with that myself as long as it's diluted in another liquid because they can't perceive it. And I know a nurse who that she gives her kids uh, her, her their alcoholic tinctures and no no issues at all. But I know I do understand some people can't or don't want to. So glycerin's a good alternative. What you want to be sure to do if you're working with glycerin is use about 75% glycerin and 25% distilled water. And the reason for that is that the glycerin super viscous and thick and the water will thin it and just help with that extraction process. So that's what I would go with for that. Let's see here. Oh, thanks, Lori. I'm so, she says, hi, Heidi. I'm so excited to be learning from you. Uh, this morning's live chat was really great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, we had our first Five Best Herbs uh, workshop this morning. And my goodness, the questions we were, went on and on. They give me a two-hour window. And guess how long I was on for? <laughs> it was two hours. It was a lot. Of, I love answering the questions. And just, just raising awareness of how amazing these medicinal herbs are for us. They're all around us. They're at our fingertips. They're even in the grocery store. And yet we do, we've lost the knowledge of these medicinal herbs. Let me rephrase that. We have not, quote unquote, lost the knowledge. It has been uh, stolen from us by the American Medical Association back in the 1930s and 40s when they crushed the eclectic herbalists. Uh, it's been stolen from us by the FDA to an extent, the government, the health insurance industry, big pharma for sure, big pharma does not like herbalists. <laughs> they don't they don't want people knowing what these herbs can do for us. And so that it's it's time for us to reclaim the knowledge and then you you have to put some time and effort into that, but it's well worth it because you leave a legacy for your kids and your grandkids forever and you want to tell them to pass it on and keep passing it because um I have a feeling the way things are going in the world right now, I just suspect that Things are going to be um, 
what we're allowed to say right now is going to go away again. So just, uh, and I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist or anything, but I've, I've seen it even in my own business. I've seen the censorship in my business. I've been shut down here and there by Google or have had them refuse to send things um, that I've, I'm sending in an email or even by a Google Drive. They'll, they'll flag it as inappropriate content when it's not at all. It's very, uh, anyway, <laughs> there you go. I've had my Facebook page shut down before. That's when I took my student groups. Um, my student community is off of social media. I pay for a pr private platform for them. And uh, yep, that way we can talk a at least a little bit more freely about wellness and health and things like that than we can on, on social media, like right here. You know, if YouTube ever decides they don't like me, well, guess what? I'm gone, <laughs> you know? Anyway, <laughs> oh, hey, Jean's here. Teresa, let's see. Thank you, Teresa. I love the information you share with us. Um, let's see. What can you tell us about Bill Berry and Henbit Nettle? Well, I love Bill Berry. First of all, they're delicious. <laughs> and second of all, they're extremely good for you. They're high in antioxidants and uh, they're excellent for your eyes. So really a helpful, helpful herb. Um, and I just really enjoy them as a nutritive. They're another one of the nutritive category as well. Uh, henbit is, <laughs> I love henbit. It's a little weed that emerges in the spring, right about now in many places, a little purple top. And uh, it's edible. It really doesn't have a great number of medicinal uses, but it's it's a nice little edible. So uh, let's see. Tammy says, I have been drinking nettle infusion, but is it better to tincture? And so, Tammy, when you're working with herbs, I'm going to this is a question that I'm going to answer with. It depends because you need to have the intention for what you're taking the herb for in mind first. So let's just say that you're interested in working with nettle because of the antihistamine effect it can have on the body for seasonal allergies. So if that's your intention, then um, working with it as a, as a tincture is absolutely fine. You're still going to get the compounds necessary for it to act as an antihistamine in the body. Now, in terms of the nutritional value, um, you know, which nettle is extremely high in mineral content, calcium, potassium, uh, magnesium, a, a lot of, there's a broad range of minerals in nettle leaf. And that's why it's going to be a, a, have a little bit of a salty flavor actually. And that's because of all the minerals, but minerals are not extractable in water or um, I'm sorry, they're not, ex <laughs> I'm like brain dead from this morning. It was a long chat. Uh, minerals are not extractable in alcohol. So uh, what you want to do is drink your nettle tea, a very, very strong tea steeped for a long time um, with heat is the best way to get your minerals out of your nettle. So depending on what you're using that nettle for, that would be your choice in terms of what you'd want to use as your solvent. Yeah, so it might be better to tincture and it might not. <laughs> it depends on, on, on what you are using it for. Let's see. Deepwater Homestead says, I love Dr. Barry, and have you heard Dr. Chaffee yet? I think I've listened to him once or twice. One of my friends, um, uh, Chris Dalziel over at uh, Joy Belief Farm uh, listens to them, and she told me, Heidi, you need to uh, listen and, and learn about the carnivore diet. So I'm looking into that right now, too. I, I'm kind of, I've always been kind of leery about uh, these diet plans that cut out whole entire food groups. But on the other hand, when you listen to the evidence about, you know, the actual way that human beings are used to eat and are supposed to eat, it really kind of makes you wonder um, about, uh, well, obviously our diet here in America is so awful anyway, with all the garbage that's in food. Um, yeah. I don't know. Joe and I bought this meat product. We thought it was okay. It was supposed to be like um, gyro slices, which is lamb. And, and we were eating it and it was like, this doesn't quite taste right. <laughs> and so we were looking at the ingredients and the first ingredient said meat product. And then 
I was like, is this bioengineered? That was the thought that went through my head. And here's the law about the bioengineered food. They don't have to put that on the label. They do not have to put uh, BE anywhere on the label. Okay, if they have a phone number that you can call, then then they don't have to put that on. They don't have to claim it on the label at all. So a lot of people, you know, they'll just quickly look at a label and see that BE is not on there and feel like it's okay. That's actually what I did. But when I looked closer at the label after we like were tasting it, going, mm, not sure about this, um, I noticed the phone number. And then when I saw the phone number, I was like, yeah, this is uh, probably not... Uh, not good to eat. So we tossed it. I hate to say, I won't even give that stuff to my dogs. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Let's get back to the chat here. What time is it? I've got a few more minutes. Um, what are some good herbs for arthritis? Ashley, so I love working with turmeric and black pepper first and foremost. Um, it, it's really, they're really beneficial in terms of the inflammation and the pain. Um, other things that you'd want would be, um, collagen and, and real collagen would be um, something to start supplementing with that might be very, very helpful. I've heard it works with some people. And then glucosamine is another supplement that you can uh, take a look at for arthritis. And then topically, if you want a really good salve, the cayenne and ginger pain relief salve that I have on uh, YouTube here is really helpful for a lot of people. So you could try that too. But I love, a cayenne contains capsaicin. And the capsaicin in cayenne, when it's used in a salve form, it can actually, it, you guys, everything we put on our skin soaks in, okay? So just keep that in mind. <laughs> but the capsaicin can actually sink in through the skin, get into the joints, and, and actually support the healing process. So um, that's why cayenne is so wonderful as a salve. Just be sure you wash your fingers before you touch your eyes or things like that <laughs> because it can hurt. Hmm. Anth says, hi, Heidi, what's your take on using tooth powders for dogs' oral health? I think it's fabulous. I would use that tooth powder recipe that I have on, on YouTube. I would, uh, I'd put, I'd use that on my dogs. Absolutely. Just gently, you know, you don't want to scrape the enamel off. Oh, Deepwater Homestead says, I follow Dr. Barry and the proper human diet. I, it changed my life in a great way. Oh, good. That's what Chris told me too. Yep. She had nothing but good things to say about it. Let's see, Lilia says, if I want to get more into the chemistry and learn how the plants work in depth, what course would be best for me? So uh, Lilia, I would say that um, the Confident Herbalist Tribe, that's my herbal membership, is a really good course for that. Um, it's not really a course, actually. It's, it's a membership. And when some people do own it like a course, but we keep adding more content. So every month or every two months, depending on what's happening um, with life and with my research writer and myself, <laughs> um, a new masterclass comes out. And the books, they range in size from about 50 pages, maybe 40 on the low side, to I think the garlic book was like 80 some pages long. And that's because they're extremely thoroughly researched. In fact, um, I have not come across another herbal resource where they're as thoroughly researched as what we have inside the Confident Herbalist tribe. So um, if you're interested in the phytochemistry, if you're interested in in-depth plant studies, plus a super community that's amazing. And uh, we talk about more, it's a more advanced type of herbalism situation, but beginners do really well in there too. And they learn really, really fast because you're surrounded by a lot of knowledge. <laughs> it's not just me. It's a, it's a whole bunch of people that are, are really amazingly educated in herbalism and aromatherapy too. In fact, Jean, who's here in the, in the chat, she's 
um, a level two aromatherapist, just like I am. And she's amazing. Um, she catches me in some of the things I say. <laughs> I learned at two different aromatherapy schools. One was super conservative and one was extremely liberal. And um, so I kind of have this weird mixture. And she airs on the side of the ultra conservative. And I think that's really, really good when you're learning um, something for the first time. So I love that she's in there um, monitoring the aromatherapy. And in fact, when I start the aromatherapy one certification uh, course, which is coming, <laughs> I promise, uh, she's going to be a case study manager um, for that course. So lots of knowledge, lots of good, good support. Let's see. Sandy says, hi, Heidi, I woke up with a cold this morning and made made the nasal decongestant. What is the dosage? It doesn't say thank you. So Sandy, I have several decongestants, uh, remedies. So I'm wondering if it, if you made the Oxymel with the vinegar and the honey and the cinnamon and the cayenne. I'm wondering if, if that's the one you made. You can take a teaspoon or whatever as often as you like. That's a th Those are actually foods that work as a decongestant when in that form. So it's totally safe if that's the one you're talking about. Um, let's see here. Can I just say this too? I just want to mention this. You guys, when you learn herbalism and you know what the herbs do and you've got experience under your belt and a good teacher and a good student group you can go to to ask questions of, you know, stuff comes up and, and you, what happens if you have to make something really fast, like on the fly? That happened to me actually yesterday. My mom was supposed to come over for Easter uh, dinner and she called at the last minute and she said, I, I'm not feeling well. And she sounded awful. And, and she's 83. So I was worried. I'm worried. You know, it's uh, you when you have elderly people and they're contracting things they have to do with the lungs. Pneumonia is a very real um, side effect or you know you can go into that realm very very quickly and uh and i'm very cognizant of respiratory health and lung health and mainly also too because i have scarred lung tissue um doctors think that i used to be a smoker but i have never smoked in my life but it's because i've had bouts of pneumonia in my long ago past when i was a kid um so I'm very, very careful with the with the lungs. And so I heard her talking on, and she was wheezing and I'm like, oh no. So I ran in and I she had a little fever. So I picked her up. I didn't pick her up. <laughs> I gathered herbs that would be really helpful for low grade temperature, aches and pains um, and things like that. This one, mullein, marshmallow, and peppermint. This says travel on this because Joe and I are getting ready to take a business trip. And um, I might. I thought, hey, if I'm going to be making these for my mom, I'll make some for me too. <laughs> and this is a cough tea. It's got herbs in here that are exceptional for cough. And I figured, okay, she can make tea. And tea is wonderful when you're having difficulty with um, respiration because you're getting that steam. You're inhaling the steam as you're sipping the tea. So you're getting a, I got a fly here, a double whammy of goodness. And then elderberry tincture, echinacea tincture. And I, I sometimes will combine these together. But the thing is, is that you want to use them both a lot when you're first at the beginning of an illness. You can literally cut a cold or flu um, situation in half by, or less even, by getting these into your body immediately and often. So I, I gave her those. And then I have a cough tincture here that's really powerful. I love this. And, mm. and then um, another respiratory care. Uh, this is a massage oil with essential oils. So it's a kind of a vapor rub substitute. Um, and I didn't have time to make her a salve. So I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and put this in a massage oil and it smells so good. But uh, there are essential oils in here that are proven to boost the immune system as well as open up airway passages. And if you rub it on your chest, shoulders, around your neck, um, around your ears, you're you're really good to go. And and I just want to say, as I was making this stuff up for my mom uh, yesterday, I I just felt so grateful, so grateful to know this this stuff. You know, years ago, I would have been going to the drugstore to get her garbage, and and now I could 
go over there and take her these very beautiful herbal preparations that are so much better for her body. My mom's tiny. She's only 4'11", and she uh, doesn't weigh very much. And, you know, she's she's actually not very frail. She's strong as a little ox, <laughs> but, but she's sick. And so I, I do definitely worry about that. And, but what a blessing it is, you guys come to that workshop tomorrow. Let me see if I still have the link five best herbs. It's free. Um, and I'm going to be honest. It's I'm after I teach about the herbs and talk about what they can do for you. We do talk about ditch the drugstore, but you can hop off anytime you want to. Oops. And on top of that, um, let's see here. Let me grab that link again for you. Um, you get a book that goes with it, and it's it's all free. Okay, and it'll give you some ideas about five easy to find and grow herbs that you can actually use to start your own home apothecary right away and have remedies. So I just dropped that link in the chat and you can uh, just go sign up right now. Even, even if you can't make it live, go ahead and sign up because you'll get the replay. Okay. All right. What time is it here? I've got about five more minutes and I have to go here. Uh, let's see here. Da da da. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Munyakita. I like that name, Munyakita Blue Green. That's so cool. Hello, just finished watching your healthy bone tea blend for the 10th time. LOL. Love your videos, learning so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really glad. Jennifer says, Heidi, I'm looking for herbs to support varicose vein problem and pain. Thank you. So Jennifer, this is a medical question. And, and again, if I was working with you as a client, I would um, I would be looking at a lot of different uh, things about how they're presenting in your legs. Are they distended? Are, how's the circulation? Um, I would be, you know, we'd be talking about your weight. We'd be talking about just um, your, your overall peripheral, um, you know, your hands and feet and legs. Are they warm, cold to the touch? Like what's going on? So we kind of, uh, herbalists will dig into something like this instead of just saying, oh, go take some horse chestnut or something. <laughs> but um, but that's the way we would approach it. So without knowing more in general, I can generally speaking um, and just basically say look into horse chestnut that can be helpful however horse chestnut is a low dose herb so i would not try to go buy the herb and and work with it yourself um you would want to go with an herbalist to do that um but you can buy the supplements that are helpful so that might be something especially if they're large and distended you mentioned painful so um, but talk to your doctor first and be sure that you know they're on board with, with that um, solution or that suggestion. The other thing you can do is you can make a massage oil that contains essential oils that stimulate the circulation in that area. And those would be things like rosemary is great. Juniper is really helpful. Ginger is nice. Uh, those kinds of essential oils can just bring warmth and more oxygen to the area. Um, now, I just want to say this too. If you have distended varicose veins and they are painful, please do not, don't massage like this. <laughs> don't, don't rub them because it's possible that you could dislodge a clot and have issues from that. So I always suggest just a gentle upward stroking movement. Very, very gentle, just soft. You don't have to rub hard. You don't have to rub at all. Just kind of smooth it onto your legs. And then if you can put your legs up the wall, that might alleviate some pressure as well um, to, to be a little bit helpful. <clears throat> oh, thanks, Rosa. She says, um, thank you, Heidi. Please give a thumbs up. This is very helpful. I appreciate that. I always forget to ask people to uh, do the thumbs up or the likes and the comments and the shares. So those of you who do that, thank you, thank you, and thank you. It helps the channel to, to grow. Uh, Melissa says, Hi, Heidi. Are there any herbs or tea that I can give daily to my toddler of five years old against constipation? He doesn't eat vegetables or fiber foods. If it tastes good, that would be great, too. Well, um, fiber is really kind of important. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if he might drink smoothies, you know, with that have, you know, fiber 
uh, included. That's probably the direction that I would go there, um, you know, with a little bit of flaxseed and things like that. You could actually add a little bit of fennel, powdered fennel seed to a smoothie like that. And fennel does have mild laxative actions that might help him out. There are herbs that are, um, that are a little bit more laxative, um, but I don't really like to recommend those for little ones. Uh, uh, herbs like senna um, is an example, or cascara sagrada. Those, those can be very powerful. And when you're working with little children, you need to be super, super careful. Um, so I, I don't suggest you do that unless you're working with an herbalist who knows what they're doing. Um, but uh, fennel is really a nice one. And flaxseed is, an, is, other, is another nice one. You can get the powder, put that in this little smoothie for him. Um, and I just want to mention, I, I don't want to scare you guys away from Senna or Cascara Sagrada because they're extremely helpful and useful, especially if you're older, an older child or an adult. But what they do is they increase the peristalsis in the intestinal tract and the colon, and that helps to push things out. And so it can cause gas and bloating and some pain in some people. Other people, it doesn't do anything. And so if you're using those herbs like that, you might want to go with a, a bit of a stool softener as well, like prunes. And besides that, prunes would be great for your little guy. <laughs> go get some prune juice and see if he'll drink the prune juice. You can mix it with other juices. I do not like giving um, children uh, juice from the store that contains sugars, though. So be sure it's 100% actual juice if you do that. Um, you don't, you don't want your baby having high fructose corn syrup, trust me. <laughs> okay, let's see. Hi, Donna. Oh, Donna says, if we take your cold and flu course, how long do you, do we have access to the course? Thank you. Um, I'll, forever. <laughs> it's always yours. I'm not one of these schools that... Um, takes courses away from people. Uh, the tribe is a membership. It's a, There's two parts, there's two ways you can be in the tribe. You can um, get in there really inexpensively on a subscription, or you can pay for it like you would a course, and then you're just in for life. And so the tribe's a little bit different, but all of my other courses, once you buy them, you own them, okay? So I, I have a lot of people, they'll like, purchase something knowing that they don't have time right now to dig in real, real quickly or hard, but they know that they're going to in like six months and they want to be sure that they, the price doesn't get raised or whatever. So I have a lot of people who'll just, you know, buy a course and then wait until it's convenient for them to, to get in. Let's see here. Heidi, my husband has chemo-induced neuropathy that has not gone, gone away. Is there any good advice to help with that? Well, First off, um, I would want to know if I was working with your husband, client to herbalist, I would want to know uh, what the doctor says about it and uh, get some information that way. And then I would probably go ahead and choose some um, herbs and essential oils to work with that. And um, some of the, and I also want to know about medications that he's on and different things. I'd have to like know a little bit more um, about that. But with that said, you can use essential oils that stimulate circulation in areas. Like I, a minute ago, I was talking about the varicose veins. Um, so those kinds of essential oils can be helpful in situations of neuropathy. And I also want to say cayenne. Cayenne can be really helpful too. The thing, the nice thing about cayenne that really help, makes it be a wonderful analgesic is not only does it stimulate circulation in an area, and I'm, I'm going to talk topical use as well as internal use for a moment, um, but it's, a no, it's an anti-nociceptive herb, which means that it, it numbs the nerve uh, endings on the skin. So that really does help with the pain. That's how it has its analgesic action. So isn't that great? Cayenne is wonderful. And then when you take it internally, and I just like to put a few drops in my water, I, I need to have it sitting here on my desk. <laughs> but what it does is it's a dispersant. It's a dispersive herb. So it gets into your system and it brings warmth to the peripheral areas. It's really helpful for cold people or for people with certain kinds of neuropathy. It might be helpful for that, but you could give that a try and see if that helps. 
Um, talk to your doctor first, though. I should keep saying that, you guys. If you're on meds, talk to your doctor. <laughs> All right. Um, and none of this is a substitute for medical advice. Just want to, just want to say that. I'm coming to get you. <laughs> says, hey, what alternative would you recommend for post or for menopausal women to protect brain, bones, and reducing risks of breast cancer? Thanks. So, yes, what I would say is take a look at the bones tea recipe. It's on my website. It's really helpful for the bones. It's got tons of mineral rich herbs. Uh, the brain, I just did a video on nootropic herbs that you could explore. Um, and I love the nootropics. I mean, we all want to keep our brain power, right? So uh, look up that. And nootropic is spelled N-O-O-T-R-O-P-I-C. So that could be um, something that you could do. And then reducing breast cancer. You know what? Boy, the it's I, there's so much. <laughs> That's quite the topic. But just off the top of my head, I would say get rid of the toxins in your environment get identify and get rid of the xenoestrogens in products stop using commercial skincare i know this sounds a little extreme but you cannot believe the endocrine disruptors that are out there a xenoestrogen compound is a compound that acts like estrogen in your body only it's on steroids and it messes people up really bad especially um, women i think uh, because we have estrogen receptors and so do men, but you know, we have more of them because we're women and the, those xenoestrogens get in there and take the spot of our real estrogen. And especially if we're going through menopause where our estrogen levels are decreasing, boy, now we're really in trouble. Um, an offset to that are herbs that contain isoflavones um, or phytoestrogens, and those are plant estrogens. And everybody gets all worried about plant estrogens, but to be honest, they, in the scale and the, uh, on the, of the strength of estrogen compounds, they're super, super weak. But what they do do is they'll go into our body and they will also bind to those est estrogen receptors that we have. And so now we've got a plant or a phytoestrogen taking that place. And then the xenoestrogen, the fake estrogen, the chemical bad estrogen that causes problems like breast cancer potentially can't get in there so those are just some quick little thoughts on that but there's that's a whole that's a whole talk all right you guys i really have to run um let's see but i know casadilla has this question any suggestions for reducing or eliminating caffeine yeah you uh, there's a number of ways you could just go slowly uh you might want to if you're drinking coffee uh switch to a different uh kind of caffeinated herb that's milder i would say like black tea is right up there near coffee by the way but maybe green tea or yerba mate is really wonderful because uh yerba mate is caffeinated but the uh, because of the alkaloids it has, it doesn't, and coffee's full of alkaloids too, but the way that yerba mate chemistry is, is the um, energy is a little more sustained. It actually also helps the brain. So, um, but consider something like that and then just slowly cutting back. All right, you guys. I am I'm I can't answer all these questions today. So, but I will be here on Friday again. Friday um, is the day before our welcome and orientation for Ditch the Drugstore. I really hope you'll join us in the Five Herbs Workshop. That's free. Whether you want to join Ditch the Drugstore or not doesn't make a difference. I want you to get this knowledge in your hands. But it's five best herbs for your home apothecary. A workshop you walk away with the book oh whoops that has um i don't know why i keep getting these i think joe's computer is talking to mine <laughs> or something but um but you do walk away with a 29 page book and you will have recipes and remedies at your fingertips and best of all you will have an understanding of of not all of the ways ways these herbs work but a whole bunch of them and 
and I, I'm only covering five herbs because I wish I had a ton of time, but I, I could talk even longer about these five herbs, but these are five herbs that you can find in the grocery store. These are herbs that you can easily grow no matter where you live. So um, that's why I wanted it to use those broad ranges of use, easy to find, easy to grow. Boom, your, your apothecary is started, <laughs> right? So go ahead and click that link, um, sign up for the workshop. The next one, what is tomorrow? Tuesday. The next one's on Wednesday. And then I'm going to do one more on Thursday. And then I will be back here on Friday, I think at two o'clock on Friday. All right, you guys, I love you. And uh, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate you showing up to the live chats. Um, it just, it makes me happy. <laughs> thank you. And I love sharing the knowledge of herbs. All right. Have a super, fly my face here. Have a super good night, you guys. Bye-bye.